understand you being on your feet. It's been a long evening and I needed to stretch. Uh, you know, there's so many things that I'd want to share with you. The hour is late and you've been here for a long time and I'll make an attempt to be brief. Uh, it's pretty hard when you think about how much gratitude, how much passion, how much thank you exists for each and every one of you here. This truly has been a family. I'm going to address mine here in just a moment, my personal family. I told the story last night at uh, No Stone Unturned event, and I'll share it again. Most of you have heard it, you know, on the walls and the stadium and, and around, there's that statement that was made some time ago, you know, we came to Kansas State University because of the people, and we stayed because of the people with an abnormal number of opportunities to leave Kansas State and to leave Manhattan. As I've said so many times, with all of those opportunities, we never, ever interviewed for another job. There was a reason for us to be in Manhattan, and the reason was very simple. It was people. Truly, truly special. You know, the university in maybe the last uh, six years or so, you know, has forward of that, that concept that just alluded to about family. It's been a family for 30 years because of you. You know, this isn't, I mean, I'm, I'm humbled by the things that have been said tonight. But this truly is about a family. This is about you. It wouldn't have happened without you. It didn't happen because of Bill Snyder. It happened because of this family. And when we think about, or I think about my personal family, It is true, amazing sacrifices by each and every one, but such truly, truly special. You know, five children, every five, all of them here, all of them went through Kansas State University. Nine grandchildren, four of them of college age, all Kansas Staters. And the ones that are not old enough yet have already made that commitment that they will be here. Not because of me, because of the people of Kansas State University, the people of Manhattan, Kansas. Truly special. You know, it says on that stadium out there, it says Bill Steiner Family Stadium. I remember, where's uh, Tim? I, uh, Tim Weiser is here. Remember when Tim was our athletic director, I got a call from Tim one day, and he said, Coach, he said, uh, the Board of Regents, I'll probably misquote you on this, Tim, but he said the Board of Regents has uh, indicated that they want to name the stadium after you, Bill Snyder Stadium. And I was taken back by that. And I thought about it a little bit, and I, I said, I'm not sure I want to do that. He said, you don't have any options. They already voted on it. <laughs> and I said, and however I phrased it, I would consent to it if it said Bill Snyder Family Stadium. And I explained myself, and I have so many times, first and foremost, my immediate family. Such special people, such truly special people. But I also wanted to encompass the Kansas State 
in the community family of which you're a major part of. Because it has been family here for 30 years. We've gone through good times and not so good times. But we've always been together and we've always done it together, near or far. It is a special community. It is a special university. But for one reason and one reason alone, because of people, because of you. Now, my immediate family, you know, Sean's been here as, uh, I mean, everybody's been here, but Sean has been a part of this program, you know, in a detailed manner, and all the things that he has done longer than I have. Sean made a sacrifice. When I left the University of Iowa and came to Manhattan, Kansas, and Sean wanted to come, he had to come as a walk-on. He had to come as a walk-on. Consensus All-American punter. Was the leading punter in the history in the history of college football, up until the time we had to play in a windstorm against Oklahoma State, he had to punt 10 times into the wind, which knocked his average down considerably. But he is just one of an amazing family. An amazing family. And I would like, if I could ask, but I always get these standing ovations. And I know it's because your legs are, you're tired of sitting. But I'd like for you, for all of our children, our grandchildren, three of them by Judy, oldest or the youngest two, by Sharon, special, special people and grandchildren that are here today, if I could ask all of you, not to, not to family, but everyone else, if you could please stand and show your appreciation for this family. so many other things, you know, the mention of uh, the academic success of our of, uh, players in our program. So many wonderful things. And such wonderful young men in regards to how they conduct themselves and how they represent you and your university in over 30 years, how they have been able to do that with very few slip ups, which is uncommon in this game of college athletics today. To have Bob Bowlesby from the conference office here is truly special. Perhaps that one individual, you know, that can't be here was really where it all started. And that was with my mother, Marinetta Snyder, died of cancer. Died in, I think, the second year that we were here at Kansas State University. 
it's been mentioned a number of times about those 16 values, those core values, the Wildcat goals for success. But some of the players, you know, it was 12, I think, when we started, and then we added on. But those, those were all brought to me by my mother. I've often told the story. My mother, my mother was four foot nine inches tall. She never weighed a hundred pounds in her life. Strongest individual that I've ever known. She was a single parent. I was an only child. I could have gone in so many different directions that unfortunate young people do so often. She worked six days a week, 12 hours a day. She did that for me. We lived in a single room apartment. Not one bedroom, one room. We lived in downtown St. Joseph, Missouri. So she could walk to work and home. Never had an automobile. She never had a driver's license. Didn't have enough money to afford one. All of the money that she made, she put away for one reason, one reason alone. That was to send me to college. And she did exactly that. When I left high school, I went to the University of Missouri. Tried out for the football team. That's when they had freshman football. Most of you can't remember that far back. Had freshman teams. I was the eighth team quarterback on the freshman team. I didn't last very long. And I wasn't, at that time, a very good student. And I realized, because I had such great affection for my mother and loved what she meant to me, that I chose to come home and go to a local community college to save my money that burden. A gentleman came from William Jewell College, someone that has always been special in my life, a fellow by the name of Dr. Norris Patterson, who was the athletic director and the head football coach at William Jewell College. He came to see me, offered me an opportunity to come and play at William Jewell College, non-scholarship school. So I would still have to pay a certain amount of money for the education. But I wouldn't let my mother do that. And he promised me that I could have a job that would help me pay off my education. And I did that. But my mother didn't have to continue to work as hard as she did for me. I finished William Jewell College and my undergraduate education in four years. I went to, uh, or began coaching. I always thought, you know, when I was just a little too, you know, we played sports all the time. It's kind of one of those things that my mother guided me to, to kind of keep me out of trouble, I believe. And I enjoyed all of them. And I just assumed that that's what happened that you participated in sports, you got your education, and you went into coaching. So people ask me all the time, you know, what would you have done if you didn't teach and coach? And I've often said, I have no idea. I've never thought about anything else. And when I was young and a high school student, that's just what I thought that my direction was. And that's the way it played out. I went to Gallatin, Missouri, a small community, not too far from my hometown. Coached all sports. I made $6,000 a year. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. After the first year, Dr. Patterson from William Jewell called me and said, I have a good friend at a college in New Mexico, and I think you should go get your master's degree, and you could become what we know now as a graduate assistant. At that time, they didn't have that 
terminology. Well, he had been a, a guiding light for my life. I thought whatever he would ask me to do or tell me to do, I, I should do. So I consented, said yes, went to Eastern New Mexico University, uh, helped with the football program, got my master's degree, uh, and then had to look for a job. So I, I would say I interviewed, I uh, made application across the country, and they invited me to come to Indio High School in Indio, California. I accepted the job. I'd never been to California in my life. Drove out to California, found a place to stay, went to the very first meeting. I was, I think the reason they hired me because I had been a swimming coach. When I was in high school, I was a swimming coach. When I went to William Jewell College, I helped them start the swimming program and coached it briefly. So I had that on my resume. They needed a head swimming coach at Indio High School, and I could become an assistant football coach as well. When I arrived and went to that very first meeting, the principal after the meeting pulled me aside and he said, Bill, he said, I wonder if you could do me a favor. He said, we have a teacher who is carrying a child and will not be able to teach for the first semester, and I'm wondering if you could take just one of her classes. And I said, well, sure. How can I help? And he said, well, we will set you up so it fits in your schedule to take one of these classes. And I said, by the way, what's class? He said, Spanish. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I thought like everybody else that, uh, you know, whoever comes to the class, nobody would understand anything about Spanish, and I could bluff my way through it for a while. So the first day we had class, I start watching these students come through the door, and my jaw drops. 37 students in the class, five of them speak English. Now, I didn't understand. India was in the Coachella Valley. I had no idea what the Coachella Valley was all about. I found out very, very quickly. That was the struggle, I can assure you. So I, I went home and I had two thoughts, you know, either, either I figure out a way to do this or I get fired. So I tried to figure out a way. So I went back to the class the next day and I had instructions written out in Spanish. It took me about five hours to write three sentences. <laughs> and the Spanish-speaking students could gradually understand what I was trying to say, and then I explained in English to the other students. I divided them up, so there was about five Spanish-speaking students with one English-speaking student spread across the room, and my instructions to the Spanish-speaking students was to teach Spanish to the English-speaking students, <laughs> and for the English-speaking students to teach English to the Spanish-speaking students. And I monitored for a semester. <laughs> I went from William Jewell, I had a good friend, I don't know if you've ever been in Indio, California, there was a hotel there called the El Morocco, an infamous hotel. The owner was named, a uh, fellow by the name of John Peters. And on the swimming team, I also coached the age group swimming team, and the, one of the swimmers on the age group team at the time was maybe six years old. Uh, it was John Peters, Jr. So I got to know the family. And John was a graduate of the University of Southern California and was a very close friend of John McCabe. John would come to the desert and spend time with uh, Peter's family at the El Morocco Hotel. Most of you, you know, can recall, it's been a while, but uh, John McKay was one of the most infamous football coaches in, in the history of the game. So he organized it, John worked it out and, and got me on the, on the staff there. Again, no particular position, just a guy that helped, and I ended up helping them with the freshman team, etc. John McKay, to the day he died, didn't 
didn't know who I was. You know, I was hey you to him. I always had been. But it was a wonderful experience for me, and I got to start work on my doctorate at the end of the first semester. Um, the coach, the head coach at Indio, California, resigned, and they asked me to come back and be the head coach. Anyway, I, I did that, and then we went up to uh, uh, the coast, uh, Tustin, California, Santa Ana, uh, and coached at uh, Tustin High School, or excuse me, uh, Foothill High School in Tustin, and then went to uh, Austin College in Sherman, Texas. From there, Hayden Fry went to, uh, from SMU to North Texas State and hired me. We were there for two or three years, and then Hayden took the head job at Iowa, and our staff went with him. That's where we were before we came to Kansas State. Uh, just a, a brief history. And, and one of the things that I, that I learned during that period of time, because you know, when you think about it, there's a lot of news, you know, and that's difficult on the family. And I was always trying to be one step ahead of where I was. Always trying to be in a better position than what I was. And a point in time came when I realized, be where you are. Be where you are and make the very best of where you are and make it the best. And when I was at the University of Iowa, I loved it. Wonderful people, wonderful people. And it was Bobby indicated, you know, we had a great staff, great group of people, but it was a great community as well. And when I received that telephone call from Steve Miller and Jim Epps here at Kansas State University, I thought, I don't, there's no reason for me to leave. I don't want to leave. And I said, no. Steve called back again. And I said, no, one day we're at, at home, somebody knocks on the door, and it's Steve Miller. And I didn't know Steve because I'd only talked to him on the telephone, and he and Jim Epps were there and came and sat down and spent a long period of time. And finally said, you know, we're, not, we're no longer asking you to come and interview. You have the job. Will you take it? I didn't think Steve was going to leave until I said, yes, I'll take it. <laughs> Steve was a pretty persistent gentleman. But I didn't say yes, and I, they convinced me to come and talk with people about whether or not I would be interested in the job or not. And I, and I said to Steve, you know, I said, you know, we still have, and I think at the time we had three or four games remaining at the University of Iowa, and I wasn't about to disrupt the program there. And I said, you know, it, it'll be in December before I can, can get there. And I said, it, it will not. And I tried to discourage him from wanting to bring me in at that time. And he stuck with it. Little did I know that they tried to hire 15 or 20 people prior to that, and, and all of them said no. So in, our season was over with the exception of the bowl game, and I came. And, and, and this is a little, uh, kind of a long way of telling you, you know, what was the determining factor for being here at Kansas State University. So we were up here in, in uh, Legends Room here at Bramlage. Dr. Weevall, Steve Miller, Jim Epps, students, faculty members, uh, representatives from the athletic department, etc. And people were, were so gracious and so kind, and I thought, you know, this, this is just like Iowa. These are really, really neat people. But I also understood in the back of my mind, you know, they're wanting something from me. There is that reason for them to be very gracious and very kind. So I went out on the campus, and now we're, we're talking about, you know, mid-December, and it's cold, and I stood on the campus for an hour and, and stopped people and just talked 
They didn't know who I was. I didn't know them. I didn't tell them who I was or why I was there. And I asked questions. I asked about our community. I asked about the university. I asked about the athletic program, about the student body, about the faculty, about the football program. And after an hour's period of time, and I, I've said so many times, I don't know the exact number, but my guess is that I talked to 60 to 70 people. And after I went back, I thought, this could be the place. I need to visit with my family. And I indicated that. And the question was asked of me, what changed your mind? What changed my mind were the people. As I said, there were, there were students, there were faculty members, people from the community, all, people from all areas that I visited with on the campus. And what impressed me was that they were so genuine. They were caring. I've always said, Kansas State University is about people that genuinely care about people. And they did. And nobody got in a hurry. I think most places you would go, everybody would want to say, listen, it's nice talking to you, but I need to get into the warm climate. I need to get in the building. Nobody did that. They took the time and visited over and over and over again. I was impressed by the people. When I wasn't coaching about 10 years ago, I made that same statement. We came because of the people. We stayed because of the people. And when we weren't coaching, you know, we didn't fly off to Florida or fly off to California. We stayed right here in Manhattan, Kansas because of the people. And that's our intention today, because of the people. It's amazing. I thank you. I am forever indebted to you for all that you have meant to me, to my family, to this program, to our university, to our state. You truly are special. I thank you for the lovely evening, but even more so, I thank you for who you are and what you've meant in my life and the impact that you've had on my life. Mitch, Mitch and I go back a long ways. Uh, I'm honored that you're here. All of you that spoke, you know, Kevin representing the players and BJ and uh, Dr. Befall, John, all that he has meant and his family to me and to my family. Uh, Tom Ross is here, a dear friend from Iowa, came uh, from Florida to be here tonight and surprised me, or thought he did. I, found out last night that he was coming, but he was trying to surprise me. But so many of you that are here, you know, and, and again, for the right reasons. Once again, God bless each and every one of you. Thank you so very much for a lovely day. They're trying to think of a way to end this. Coach, this is where I get my rear end chew, going off the script. If you're a former player, a former coach, or a staff member, if you could get up here to the stage as close as you can, and it wouldn't be, I'd, I'd love it if the 1989 guys were kind of at first. If you guys can get just up here close, it's a locker room setting I want to recreate. Bob, George, Rod, all the coaches and players who have been here. Here's why. Locker room seven.
Think of those locker room moments, so many, after a tremendous victory and breaking out in the fight song. If you guys can turn around and our former players and coaches are going to give this tribute to coach because I want this coach and the next coach, our General Meyer has said it best, it's just starting a new chapter. And if you could have this visual every day for this next chapter of your life, hit it. Fight song for coach. Thank you for coming, Emo. 